On this episode of the Wayback Tech, we're going to be taking a look at a motherboard that I think deserves a little bit more recognition than just being forgotten in the annals of history. We'll be taking a look at the first ever jumper free BIOS, so stay tuned for that. Well, here it is, folks, the QDI Legend P5i 430TX 2B Titanium ATX Socket 7 motherboard. And boy, that is definitely a lot to say. This motherboard is quite special as it has a feature pretty much every motherboard has had, except for OEM motherboards, of course, for quite a good number of many of years now. The name QDI Legend is actually the name for the QDI group and their subsidiary, the Legend Group. And while these groups have split off now, and they're operating under different names, the Legend Group portion is still quite known in the computer market today. But they're not known as Legend Group any longer. They're actually known as somebody else that we all are very familiar with. I imagine you could guess who that is, but I'll wait till the end of the video to reveal that if you don't know. So keep watching and you'll find out. There was a little, there's a few other groups that were involved with QDI. The Chinese seem to like to have groups. I don't really know why. I don't know if they have that nowadays anymore, but they did back then, and a lot of them came together and formed a computer company, and they kept their names and separate as groups. But, but for now, let's go ahead and dive into this motherboard a little bit here and give QDI's legend group bit more credit than I think history has given them and developing such a, a wonderful and revolutionary thing that uh, we, we all have benefited at one time or another using. On the surface this looks like any ATX motherboard except that it's obviously a socket 7 board but the layout is pretty much the same and you know, the ATX motherboards haven't changed a whole lot in 20 years. If you notice, this motherboard only has one jumper on it, and there's no others to be found, and there's actually a reason for that. The only one on this motherboard is present is for the CMOS reset. It is kind of odd to see a motherboard from this time period not have any jumpers whatsoever, as a lot of motherboards back in the day just loved to be riddled with jumpers. That made your life a lot of fun when reconfiguring for CPUs. Oh, the 46 era. QDI is a Chinese-based company, and given such, it would seem reasonable to assume that these motherboards would have been cheaper quality than their Taiwanese counterparts were. And indeed, back in the day, a lot of people said, well, the PCB's a little bit thinner, they're a little bit cheaper made, they're na 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 It may seem like this board would be a cheap, crappy board with limited ability to do anything other than turn itself on and hope for the best. The first couple QDI motherboards that came onto the market were regarded in this manner, and even though one of them was the first one to have the jumper-free BIOS, people kind of snarled at that too and said, well, that's not going to work because people are going to go into the BIOS, change it, and then we'll have a whole big mess, and we don't want people changing their settings because they're dumb, stupid people. So we don't like these boards so that people could do that, even though you could probably open the case up move a jumper or two and have the same kind of problem, but, you know, whatever, you know. QDI Group was responsible for developing and patenting the very first jumper-free BIOS and that they coined it Speed Easy, which I would guess the Legend Group probably developed. And this was their first jumper-free motherboard, the QDI Explorer 2 model number P5i430VX-250DM, which is another mouthful. There are actually two versions of this motherboard, believe it or not. Uh, the one without the DM behind the 250 is the traditional jumpered motherboard, motherboard. And the 250 DM actually still retained the silk screenings on the PCB describing the placement of the jumpers and their settings and what they did and stuff like that. This was also considered to be the first overclockable BIOS-based motherboard ever made and allowed the end user to alter the multiplier, bus speed, and voltage settings and stuff like that, which as I said before, a lot of people thought was a bad idea. ABIT was quick to rush onto the scene of this and, and come out with their own version of Speed Easy, given the fact that the QDI patented it, didn't seem to stop anybody else from copying it. ABIT was the second on the market, and this is the earliest example of that motherboard that, that I have, the TX5. And it's a good working motherboard. 
They're both based on the 430 TX chipset and the overclocking abilities in the BIOSes are pretty similar, pretty pretty close to the same. I really wish that I could include SpeedEasy 2 into this video as it would be a nice comparison to show the differences between SpeedEasy and SpeedEasy 2. I do have a motherboard with SpeedEasy 2 on it. Unfortunately it's not a working motherboard and as such it, I, I can't use it for this video and unfortunately it's pretty much just a good surface warmer as the north bridge on the 440BX chipset there just gets hot and goes thermonuclear and uh, that's about the, all it does. I suppose I could turn it into a coffee warmer of some sort. So you've made it this far through the video and I'm going to go ahead and reward you. If you haven't guessed it by now, the modern name for this company is... Drum roll, please. That's a bad drum roll, I know. Lenovo. Ding, 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 ding. Yes, indeedy, folks. Lenovo, in its previous life, was responsible for the soft BIOS jumper-free based motherboards that we all enjoy today. If you ever wanted to see what the original jumper-free BIOS looked like, well, now you have. We'll be doing some more testing with it. Uh, I did put the motherboard in the case. Got it all up and running here. Put windows on and things like that. Just for chits and giggles, I decided to throw in a K6 300 processor in it, and it did something kind of interesting that I wasn't expecting. Not only did it recognize it in the BIOS as a K5, it also didn't seem to want to actually go past post. It would just sit here and do this strange reboot thing after it did the memory count and the protecting the IDE drives and just reboot itself so I don't know what's going on with that but it works fine with any other processor that other than the K6 I've only done the Intel Pentium 75 on it which I do have overclocked slightly um, but yeah it works fine definitely is a viable motherboard for testing for a testing platform anyway and not that I am in short supply of those but hey I, I might as well use it while I got it right so yeah, I'm able to find any more of those on eBay, so I hope it doesn't die. But anyway, of course, if it dies, it'll probably be my fault because that's what usually happens. You know, it survived 15 years and no, 20 years. That motherboard's almost almost going on 20 years old now. So that's and what's even more impressive is the CMOS wasn't dead. It was actually still the right. It was off by a little bit. I was actually surprised that it wasn't dead. I I would have thought it's been sitting on the shelf at work for like ever since I started working. As a matter of fact, it was actually in a box. That and the and the Pentium 2 Legend were both in a box uh, of junk parts, and I rescued them and put them on a shelf. And I I actually thought that was a Gateway or a Dell motherboard when I first looked at it because it didn't it doesn't have any any uh, name branding on the board whatsoever. It's so. <coughs> So anyway, I hope you guys liked this video. We will be doing some more videos on that. I've got so many things in the works here. It's ridiculous. I do have a video coming up on the XPS P120. I know I had a comment about that if I was still if I still had it, and I do. Uh, it is still unmolested. Well, okay, 99% unmolested. I put some more memory in it. That's about it. And the original memory is still in it, but I added another. It's weird, I added 32 gig to it, but it's only recognizing 16 of that, 32, 32 gig, <clears throat> gig, <clears throat> 32 meg. I added another 32 meg to the 16 that was already in there, and it's only recognizing it as 16 meg more, so that kind of sucks. I'm not sure, I'm going to have to check and see if that motherboard's only able to recognize 8 meg per stick, or if it can recognize 16 meg. It is a... VX chipset? I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look at my videos again because I don't remember what chipset's in there. But anyway, we'll find that out. That'll be a short, shortly upcoming video. Um, well, I didn't mean to turn this into a rambling video. I just... a rambling outro. But uh, anyway, so hope you guys like this and we'll see you next time right here on the Wayback Tech Channel. Peace out, everyone.